I can remember when I was a young man, my father uh, mentioned to me the historian's curse. That is, if someone who is a full-time student of history wants to wish you ill, wants to wish something bad on you, put a curse on you, he might say, may you live in interesting times. Because for historians, the times in history that are the most interesting to study are the difficult times, the times of trouble, times of catastrophe, times of epidemics. Uh, so I don't know if anyone has put a curse on us or not, but we are certainly living in interesting times. Uh, there are a lot of fascinating things that go on in the world in which we live. They're going on all the time, whether we're very aware of them or not, things that can uh, really stretch our minds. For example, uh, we'll talk about some of the anodyne harmless things that go on. Every second, Bill Gates earns $385.80 every second. Now, that may change now that he's stepping down from the board of Microsoft, but at least that's the last estimate that we had. Paul Sutter, an astrophysicist, estimates that the universe is expanding at greater than the speed of light. So it's expanding in all directions at 380, 186,000 miles per second plus, and that's going on every second of every day that we're alive. And inside each human body, there are 37,000 billion billion chemical reactions happening in your cells. That's 37 with 21 zeros happening after it, going after it. That's happening in the cells of each and every human body all the time. Uh, those are kind of anodyne things that are going on in the world in which we live, things we can think about and think, wow, that's, that's quite amazing, that's astounding. But there are other things going on in the world, changes that are occurring in the world in which we live that are more troubling. We know that there are terror attacks that go on in many places, and some of them are getting closer and closer to our homes than they used to be. The Middle East is always a powder keg that threatens to engulf the rest of the world in a war. Uh, there are bad actors on the world scene, like China, who are developing its military forces and threatening their neighbors. Social tensions are increasing in many of our countries. We have weird, really, really weird politics going on in a lot of the Western world, where very strange levels of dysfunction are being reached in our governments. Leaders in many nations, including leaders in education, politics, even the courts, are insisting that people think, uh, and rather that they do not think, in terms of what is clear biology. We have strange ideas out there about human sexuality now, and you can be punished if you don't go along with them or believe them. Persecution against Christians is rising in many places in the world. And now, probably the event that is on most of our minds the most right now is this COVID-19 virus, the Wuhan virus. Somewhat of an unknown to us. We've been getting some conflicting stories about it, how serious it is or it isn't. Uh, and it's changing our lives in ways that we would not have foreseen even just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that's why so many of us are sitting in our homes now, tuned into this rather unusual Sabbath service, at least unusual by the standards of what we have known in the past. And of course, it is a blessing for us, as was stated earlier, for us to have this technology available because many of the people that I serve in Africa, for example, simply don't have access to the internet. They wouldn't be able to tune in and stream a service in the way that uh, we are doing right now. So it's a strange situation on the world scene. As someone once said, where are we going and what am I doing in this handbasket? <laughs> so I have a question for us that I would like for us to think about during the time that I will have with you today. How are we going to bear up? How are we going to persevere to the end under increasingly hostile circumstances? I teach Daniel and Revelation at Foundation Institute, and just yesterday we were going through the trumpets and the seven last plagues. And when we see those things, we know that they're coming down the road. Uh, that's going to be far beyond anything uh, that we've experienced up until now. And so the stress level and the, uh, the difficulty level is going to increase over time. In order for us to persevere to the end, it will be vital for us to keep our eyes focused on the kingdom of God, on the final reward on the happiest of happy endings that God promises us in his word. And to illustrate that, I would like for us to cast our minds back to the 1930s. In the 1930s in England, the handwriting was increasingly on the wall, so to speak. People knew that there was a great war on the horizon. Even if certain appeasing politicians assured them that war could be averted, more and more people knew that it wasn't going to be the case, and it would be a different war from any war that was before it. 
So I've got a few photos that I'll show you here. Here you have the, the pre-war crowd around uh, um, the, uh, in central London, and they're uh, just enjoying being out and enjoying the day. And pretty soon those days were going to be over. People wouldn't be able to have that carefree life that they had known before. Instead, there would be barrage balloons flying over Buckingham Palace and men and even women who were past the normal age of military service would be called up to the home guard and would be trained in case of an invasion. It was foreseen that there would be air raids and that people would need to use the subway system, the tube as it's called in London, as air raid shelters. And sadly, children were going to learn about the destruction of war that they were going to see in their own homes. In the spring of 1939, foreseeing the coming of this great war, the British government commissioned a series of morale posters. They were designed to reassure the British people in the dark days that would lie ahead. So the posters were supposed to be uniform in style and in font. They were supposed to be attractive and have clear text so that we would be difficult for the enemy to counterfeit them. They used the crown of King George VI as a decorative device, and they used only two colors in these posters. Of the final three designs that entered production, the first of them said, freedom is in peril, defend it with all your might. And these were distributed around London and around England. The second of them said, your courage, your cheerfulness, your resolution will bring us victory. And these also were widely distributed around England at that time. But the third poster of which over two and a half million copies were printed, said simply, keep calm and carry on. The first two were delivered in 1939 and they were visible throughout Great Britain in shop windows, train stations, and other uh, areas of commerce. But the keep calm posters were held in reserve to be used only in a time of great crisis, perhaps an invasion, which some foresaw. And ultimately, these posters were never formally displayed. In fact, they remained invisible to the public until a copy was found 50 years later. It wasn't until the year 2000 that Stuart Manley, the owner of a used bookstore in Annick in Northumberland, and I have to warn you, if you're going to look that up, if Americans are going to look that word up, Annick, it's one of those English shibboleth words that's not spelled anything the way it's pronounced. There's an L and a W in there somewhere, but it's not pronounced. So Annick in Northumberland, <laughs> he found one of these posters in a box of dusty old books that he had bought at auction. And as they were rummaging through this box, his wife came across the poster and she liked it so much that she framed it and hung it on the wall near the cash register of their bookstore. And the poster was so popular with customers that a year later they started printing copies of them for sale. And this has become a very widely known uh, motif now. This poster is very well known. Since that time, it's been copied. It's been parodied. So you can find all sorts of takeoffs on it. Keep calm and call Batman. Or uh, keep calm, who are we kidding? Or panic and run away. Uh, you've seen many different takeoffs on, these, uh, on this particular poster. But it still remains a very common motif that we see. It's entered our... Western culture, certainly English-speaking culture. And it's difficult to say why this particular phrase from a long time ago would still have such resonance with people today. It's simple, it's rather timeless, it's very easily recognizable, and it seems to be the words that somehow move people. It's a reminder of a simpler time. They are words that instill trust and encourage confidence in people. And these are, in fact, words that should never fade from fashion, and they probably won't. Keep calm and carry on. I would like for us to reflect today for a few minutes on the fact that these are words, this is a principle by which we need to abide in our lives as Christians as well. This is an important principle of Christianity. Keep calm and carry on. In our lives today, as this age of man hurdles toward its bitter ends, we must go on about our spiritual business, whatever happens around us, without being distracted by the wider world. What's happening inside us is more important than what's happening around us. And we should never lose sight of the fact that God is in charge, God has a plan, and his plan will be fulfilled to the minutest detail. God's word, the Bible, encourages us to remain calm in life 
and to place our confidence and our trust in God, to exercise faith and loyalty in our lives each and every day. Let's look at a couple of scriptures that, uh, that show that to us. Proverbs chapter 17, for example. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 27. Proverbs 17, verse 27. There we read, he who has knowledge spares his words, and a man of understanding is of a calm spirit. When we have true and deep spiritual understanding, when we're very aware of what God is doing and what his plan is, then we're going to be of a calm spirit. We're not going to be easily rattled. We're not going to panic or uh, lose control of our thoughts or our emotions. A man of understanding is of a calm spirit. And so it's important for us to dwell on the understanding that we have of God's plan. Uh, I'll also turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 4. Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 4. But I'm going to read it to you in the New International Version, which I think is a, a very interesting translation of this verse. Ecclesiastes 10 verse 4 in the New International Version says... If a ruler's anger rises against you, do not leave your post. Calmness can lay great errors to rest. Calmness can lay great errors to rest. When we keep our composure, when we keep our concentration, when we focus on what is truly important and on what we need to be doing, we can lay great errors to rest. We can save ourselves from making great errors, and we sometimes may even be able to help other people avoid making great errors as well. When we're distracted, when we allow ourselves to become fearful or we panic about something, when we lose our tempers, we can easily make mistakes, sometimes serious mistakes. And in the history of God's physical people, Israel, over the course of their history, they sometimes made that mistake. They lost sight of what their mission truly was, and they made great mistakes. One of those examples is found in Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30. This is the context here is when Assyria was encroaching farther and farther down toward Israel. And this great juggernaut of the Assyrian military was frightening everybody in the whole Middle East. And um, the Jews, to whom Isaiah was speaking there, they were told by God what they should do. They were told, just be calm, keep calm, carry on, trust God, and things will go well with you. But that wasn't what they wanted to do. And in fact, they refused to do that to their hurt. So Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15. Thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. That's all they needed to do. But God said, you would not. You wouldn't just remain calm and quiet and let confidence in God be your strength. And you said, no, for we will flee on horses. Therefore, you shall flee. And we will ride on swift horses. Therefore, those who pursue you shall be swift. One thousand shall flee at the threat of one, and at the threat of five you shall flee till you are left as a pole on the top of a mountain and as a banner on a hill. There's not going to be much left of you because you rejected confidence in me. You decided you were going to take matters into your own hands and do what you wanted to do and not, uh, not trust in me. Israel faced a national threat, and instead of staying calm and relying on God, they panicked and decided they were gonna fix things themselves. They would fix things in their own way. And it turned to national disaster. Let's look also at Proverbs chapter four. Proverbs four, starting in verse 23. This is another section of the Proverbs that encourages us to remain calm, to be collected, to be self-aware, to be aware of what we are and what we're about and what we need to be about, what our focus truly should be. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Proverbs 4, verse 23. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far away from you. Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. In other words, keep calm and carry on. Follow the path that you've started to walk. 
You've made decisions about the way you're going to live your life. You've made right decisions. You're going to follow straight paths. Well, then do so. And don't be distracted by what may happen either to the right or to the left. Do not turn to the right or left. Remove your foot from evil. Turning to the right or the left can end up being a bad thing to do. And so we don't want to do that. We need to stay focused. God will be our deliverance. He has promised that many, many times in his word, and it's just important for us to stay focused on that. Please turn with me also to Psalm 118. Psalm 118 is an interesting psalm for a couple of reasons. Uh, psalm 118 is one of the Hallel psalms. Hallel is, means praise. Uh, we say, when we say hallelujah, that's a part of the word. It's a Hallel. These psalms were used in the temple liturgy, and Psalm 118 is what is called one of the Egyptian Hallels because the priests recited or sang this psalm when they were sacrificing lambs at Passover, which we will be uh, celebrating, the New Testament Passover, very soon now. According to some commentators, it is likely that this was the psalm that Jesus and the disciples sang at the end of the Passover celebration just before he was delivered to the Romans and led to his crucifixion. It is a psalm that praises God's deliverance how he takes care of his people, how he protects them, how he watches over everything that happens to his people. And the mission of his people has always been and will always be simply to do what God has asked them to do, to follow through with their individual particular mission, to be faithful, to be loyal, to continue our efforts to accomplish God's will during our lifetime. The future is certain, even if events happening around us can seem scary. Uh, Jews remember this particular psalm at the Feast of Tabernacles. This is one of the psalms that they read also at the Feast of Tabernacles. So uh, let's read through Psalm 118 and see what we can learn from it, what we can glean from it. And as we're going to see, this is also a psalm that contains some prophecies about what Jesus was going to do, uh, what the Messiah would do when he came. Psalm 118, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good because his mercy endures forever. Our God is good and he's merciful and he loves his people. Let Israel now say his mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say his mercy endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord now say his mercy endures forever. We can always count on God's mercy. I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I shall see my desire on those who hate me. My enemies are going to receive a just recompense for the evil that they do. And we can trust God to take care of that. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes or governments or whoever else we might be tempted to put confidence in. All nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surrounded me. Yes, they surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surrounded me like bees. They were quenched like a fire of thorns. For in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. You pushed me violently that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. And he is still the salvation of God's people to this day. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. What a wonderful psalm talking about the experience of God's people in ancient times and God's mercy still endures forever and he still intervenes to care for his people. What we need to do is 
as Moses told the Israelites in Exodus 14, don't be afraid, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you will hold your peace. That is a principle that is still true in many parts of our lives yet today. Turn with me also, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. There's something here that I believe bears reflection on our part. We should think about it. Because it actually will take us a long way in our meditation when we understand what this means. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. In whom also, speaking of Christ, we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. We have been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. God has a purpose. He is working out a great purpose. He does things on purpose and allows things on purpose. And he always has a purpose. Now, that's probably not a word that we use very often. We may say, uh, accuse somebody of having done something on purpose. We did that when we were children. I would say, my sister did that on purpose. That was about the only time that we would use that word. But it's an interesting word to consider. What does purpose mean? Purpose, our English word, comes from an old French word, porpose, and that comes from the Latin proponere, which means to set out or to set before you. So it's something that's set out in front. This is, this is my goal. This is what I intend to accomplish. God has a purpose. Now, the definitions of purpose are these. The reason for which something is done or created or for which something exists. Uh, God has a purpose. Another noun, for, a noun usage for purpose, a person's sense of resolve or determination, to have a sense of purpose, to have a sense of mission. God has a mission. He's on a mission to accomplish certain things, certain things that concern our future. And purpose can also be a verb. It can to mean to have as one's intention or objective, as in God purposed this victory. And here in Ephesians, we read that we've been preordained, predestined rather, according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. That's really huge when we think about that. Everything that happens is a part of God's purpose. Even things that he allows that are unpleasant in the short term, it's all there for the fulfilling of God's purpose. He always has a purpose and his purpose is always good. The challenge for us as human beings is that we don't always see in the immediate what that purpose is. We don't even sometimes, or we can only sort of envision the ultimate purpose of certain events that might happen in our lives. We don't understand why. Sometimes we do, at least in part, we can understand a little bit of why certain things are allowed in our lives. Uh, sometimes we can just guess at it. And sometimes we just don't really have a clue. Why, why is this happening to me now? I don't know. But even when we don't know, we can know that God does. He has a purpose. And in order to fulfill that purpose, we need to just continue doing our job, continue fulfilling our part. There is a memorable quote in book one, chapter two of J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. When the diminutive Bilbo Baggins learns that a, a mighty conflict is stirring once again, a conflict in which he is going to have to play an important role and he says this, he says, I wish it need not have happened in my time. And Gandalf replies, so do I, and so do all who live to see such times, but that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. We don't get to pick the part we play in God's plan. God does that. He's working out a magnificent plan and he's graced us with a part to play in it. He's chosen our part for us, and he gives us strength to play that part successfully to the final triumphant conclusion. And our choice is simply, what will we do with the time given to us? We don't see everything that God is doing behind the scenes, but we do get glimpses of it in his word, 
And we can be very aware that there's a lot more going on that's invisible to us than what we can readily understand. I think one very striking example of that is found in 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. <clears throat> Second Kings chapter 6, Elisha with his servant is being pursued by a large contingent of a, of a, uh, a military that was hostile to him. And um, one of his servants said, verse 12, none my lord or king, but Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. That's how he's always a step ahead of you. It's this Elisha the prophet. So he said, go and see where he is that I may send and get him. And it was told him, saying, Surely he's in Dothan. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, he looked out the window, and there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, My master, what shall we do? We are done for. There is no way out of this. Uh, we're trapped. And he answered, Do not fear. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And as I try to imagine this scene, and I hope you do that sometimes too when you read these stories, try to imagine how this is playing out. And I imagine the face of the servant when Elisha says, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And the servant's going, one, two. And he's looking out the window and there's thousands, you know, hundreds or thousands of soldiers out there and chariots and horsemen. And he must have had a very perplexed expression on his face. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. In verse 17, Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. They had always been there, but the young man hadn't been aware of it. He hadn't seen it. There are things that are happening in the spirit world around God's people today that we don't see, but uh, would be astounding and amazing to us if we ever had the chance to see them. And one day, of course, we'll know all of that. We'll see it. But that's what's going on. That's the true reality of things, even though we cannot see it. We can't always see what's going on, but it's there. God is very actively working out his plan in the lives of each and every one of us. The prophet Jeremiah had one of the most challenging careers of all of God's servants, certainly among the prophets in the middle of repeated deportations from Judah to Babylon, God's message came to the Jews that were left there just to submit to Nebuchadnezzar and to live. That was their mission, keep the Jewish people alive, keep the Israelite nation alive and cognizant of its own identity. That was necessary for what was going to happen farther on in God's plan. But we know that during Jeremiah's time, there was a false prophet who claimed that God was going to overthrow Nebuchadnezzar in two years. And so the king decided he wanted the Jews to revolt against Nebuchadnezzar and to try to gain their independence again, which of course was not God's will. God had already made his will known to them. He said, submit, just submit, get on with your lives, keep calm, carry on. And so under God's inspiration, Jeremiah wrote a beautiful letter with some very encouraging words. He encouraged the people of the nation to keep calm and just carry on with their mission. We can read about that in Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah 29. Starting in verse 4. Jeremiah 29 verse 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and dwell in them, plant gardens and eat their fruit, take wives and beget sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands so that they may bear sons and daughters that you may be increased there and not diminished and seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive and pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace, you will have peace. If Babylon is in peace, you will have peace. So just get on with your life. Don't revolt. Don't struggle. Don't try to overthrow this. It's not going to work. It won't happen. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you. 
nor listen to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed, for they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, said the Lord. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart, and you'll get to go back. Your, your descendants, your children and grandchildren will go back to the land that you want to go back to. But your mission right now is just to keep the nation alive and keep your identity. That was their mission. And some didn't want that mission. They didn't want to do that. They wanted, they wanted independence right now and freedom right now. And they wanted to throw off the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar right now. And that wasn't what God wanted them to do. He had caused them to go into captivity. He would bring them out at the right time. And they needed to accept that that was their mission. That was their purpose in life. And so through Jeremiah, God told them, stay focused on what you're supposed to do, what your role is in my plan. Do smell the roses along the way. Enjoy the good things of life. You can do that while you're in Babylon. But don't forget your mission. Keep a clear head. Keep a weather eye and carry on. And we know from history that some Jews allow themselves to be distracted. They quit the mission altogether, or they tried to give themselves a different mission, and they went off in a different direction, and most of them died. Those who submitted to God's will survived, as did their children, and God's purpose for them was fulfilled. And they also ultimately will have a very happy ending. So just as was the case in Jeremiah's time, we must not let anyone or anything shake our confidence in what we know. We need to remain solid and firm in what we know to be the truth established on the word of God and not allow ourselves to lose confidence or to become nervous or panicked by things that we see happening around us. It's our mission to continue working together to preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the world and to be prepared as a people for the coming of the Lord. <clears throat> I would like to read to you a section from chapter 13 of Mark Twain's life on the Mississippi. Um, Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens was his actual name. Mark Twain was his pen name. He trained to be a Mississippi river pilot. That was to steer the paddle wheel steamboats through the bends and the eddies and the shallow points, uh, the tricky navigational hazards that existed on the Mississippi River. And one lesson that he had to learn as a cub pilot was courage and confidence and not to let anyone make him doubt what he knew to be true. So let me read a, a short section to you here. The growth of courage in the pilot house is steady all the time, but does not reach a high and satisfactory condition until some time after the young pilot has been standing his own watch, alone and under the staggering weight of all the responsibilities connected with the position. When an apprentice has become pretty thoroughly acquainted with the river, he goes clattering along so fearlessly with the steamboat night or day that he presently begins to imagine that it is his courage that animates him. But the first time the pilot steps out and leaves him on his own devices, he finds out it was another man's courage. He discovers that the article has been left out of his cargo altogether. Therefore, pilots wisely train these cubs by various strategic tricks to look danger in the face and a little more calmly. A favorite way of theirs is to play a friendly swindle upon the candidate. Mr. Bixby served me in this fashion once. I had become a good steersman, so good, indeed, that I had all the work to do on our watch night and day. Mr. Bixby seldom made a suggestion to me. All he ever did was to take the wheel on particularly bad nights or in a particularly bad crossing. He played the gentleman of leisure nine-tenths of the time and collected his wages. Well, one matchless summer's day, I was bowling down the bend above Island 66, brimful of self-conceit and carrying my nose as high as a giraffe's, when Mr. Bixby said, I am going below for a while. I suppose you know the next crossing? This was almost an affront. It was about the plainest and simplest crossing in the whole river. One couldn't come to any harm whether he ran it right or not. And as for depth, there never had been any bottom there. I knew all of this perfectly well know how to run it, I could run it with my eyes shut. How much water is in it? 
Well, that's an odd question. I couldn't get to the bottom there with a church steeple. You think so, do you? The very tone of the question shook my confidence. That was what Mr. Bixby was expecting. He left without saying any more. I began to imagine all sorts of things. Mr. Bixby, unknown to me, of course, sent someone down to the foxhole with some mysterious instructions to the leadsman, and another messenger was sent to whisper among the officers, and then Mr. Bixby went into hiding behind a smokestack where he could observe results. Presently, the captain stopped, uh, stopped out on the hurricane deck next to the chief. Next, the chief mate appeared, then a clerk. Every moment or two, a straggler was added to my audience, and before I got to the head of the island, I had 15 or 20 people assembled down there under my nose. I began to wonder what all the trouble was. As I started across, the captain glanced aloft at me, and he said with a sham uneasiness in his voice, Where is Mr. Bixby? Uh, gone below, sir. But that did the business for me. My imagination began to construct dangers out of nothing, and they multiplied faster than I could keep the run of them. All at once, I imagined I saw shoal water ahead. A wave of coward agony that surged through me then came near dislocating every joint in my body. All my confidence in that crossing vanished. I seized the bell rope, dropped it, ashamed, seized it again, dropped it once more, clutched it tremblingly once again, and pulled it so feebly that I could hardly hear the stroke myself. Captain and mate sang out instantly and both together, starboard led there and quick about it. This was another shock. I began to climb the wheel like a squirrel, but I would hardly get the po pointed to, to port before I would see new dangers on that side and I would spin to the other, only to find perils accumulating to starboard and be crazy to get to port again. Then came the leadsman's sepulchral cry, deep four. Deep four in a bottomless crossing? The terror took my breath away. Mark three, mark three, quarter less three, half twain. This was frightful. I seized the bell ropes and stopped the engines. Quarter twain, quarter twain, mark twain. I was helpless. I did not know what in the world to do. I was quaking from head to foot, and I could have hung my hat on my eyes. They stuck out so far. Quarter less twain, nine and a half. We were drawing nine? My hands were in a nervous flutter. I could not ring the bell intelligibly with them. I flew to the speaking tube and shouted to the engineer, Oh, Ben, if you love me, back her. Quick, Ben, oh, back the immortal soul out of her. I heard the door close gently behind me. I looked around, and there stood Mr. Bixby, smiling a bland, sweet smile. Then the audience on the hurricane deck sent up a thunder gust of humiliating laughter. I saw it all now, and I felt meaner than the meanest man in human history. I laid in the lead, set the boat on her marks, came ahead on the engines, and said, Well, that was a fine trick to play on an orphan, wasn't it? I suppose I'll never hear the last of how I was asked enough to heave the lead at the head of 66. Well, no, you won't, maybe. In fact, I hope you won't, for I want you to learn something by that experience. Didn't you know that there was no bottom in that crossing? Yes, sir, I did. Well, then you shouldn't have allowed me or anybody else to shake your confidence in that knowledge. Try to remember that. And another thing, when you get in a dangerous place, don't turn coward. That isn't going to help matters any. It was a good enough lesson, but pretty hardly learned. Yet about the hardest part of it was that for months, I so often had to hear a phrase which I conceived a particular distaste for. It was, oh, Ben, if you love me, backer. That's the end of the quote. I find that a very interesting experience for Samuel Clemens, who took the pen name Mark Twain, and you just heard where he got that name. He allowed himself to doubt things that he absolutely knew to be true, unequivocally true. How could that happen? He began to doubt because of people who were trying to sow doubt in his mind, they were trying to manipulate him. And because of his own imagination, his own fears, and that led him to panic, and then he stopped thinking altogether. Has that ever happened to you? It has happened to me. Could it happen again in a time of world-shaking events, of stress, of frustration, of apostasy, of lying miracles? Could it happen in a time of great tribulation? It will happen to some, even to most people in the world. But it need not happen to you and me, brethren, as long as we stay focused on what we know absolutely to be true and we stay focused on our mission. 
and we keep setting one spiritual foot in front of the other, one in front of the other, and one in front of the other. Luke chapter 8. If you would please, Luke 8. Verse 22. Luke chapter 8, verse 22. Now it happened on a certain day that he got into a boat with his disciples, Jesus, of course, and he said to them, let us go over to the other side of the lake. And they launched out. But as they sailed, he fell asleep and a windstorm came down on the lake and they were filling with water and were in jeopardy. The boat was starting to sink. It was filling and it was going to sink. And they came to him and they woke him saying, Master, Master, we're perishing. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water and they ceased and there was calm. And he said to them, where is your faith? And they were afraid and marveled, saying to one another, Who can this be? For he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Jesus was easily able to calm the sea. There's nothing in the universe that God cannot calm when it's his will. He's the master of everything. He has a wonderful plan, and his plan will be fulfilled down to the minutest detail. Brethren, we're heading certainly toward the kingdom of God. It is coming. Nothing can stop it. And the only way that it could happen for us not to arrive at that destination would be for us to give up, to panic, to get discouraged, to get angry, whatever the emotion might be, and not carry on. But our mission is to trust in God. Our mission is to remain calm, to remain confident, full of faith, and to continue to act as Christians, to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and God Almighty will handle the rest. So brethren, in the coming days, weeks, months, years, decades, however long it takes, which promise to be difficult at times, in each day of our lives, let us not forget to keep calm and carry on, because we are certainly heading for the kingdom of God.